Well, thank you for staying instead of uh, going next door, although I would have loved to be at the Keening workshop from uh, Jude. So, um, ah, just going to take a breath in because I'm feeling slightly nervous. I'm not used to giving presentations like that. Usually I have a group of people and we're all sitting together. Um, and also, I think my heart beating is speaking to how much the, my journey with the Center for Human Ecology has actually been important in what I used to do and what I've continued to do, but also how it's now incarnating in uh, a project that I'm putting my head and heart and hands into in a very big way. So um, what I want to speak about today is this project that has been called uh, the Nonviolent Global Liberation Community. And I want to uh, do it in a way that will hopefully make uh, a case that what we're doing with this project is very much uh, a radical human ecology in action. And I put a question mark there because it won't be for me to judge, but maybe it's like for you at the end to say, yeah, actually there's something here that it feels important uh, in, uh, in terms of what we are here to explore and practice. So um, as some of, you, some of you who know me and have known me from my time in the, in the CHE when we were doing the master's degree, I've always been interested in, in, in the practical aspects of human ecology. I used to teach a module called Action for Transformation. And I was also involved with um, um, an approach to community development called the Training for Transformation, which was developed in Africa, um, very much based in the um, principles and uh, practices of uh, Paulo Freire, who was his, uh, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed. So, uh, to me, I've, 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 sta I've stayed very rooted in where I was 20 years ago or 25 years ago when I moved to Scotland. And now it's taken a, a kind of new form in trying to sustain and give birth to this community. So, um, I, I, I called it as well a story, the story of our experiments with truth. Now, those of you who know Gandhi and have read his autobiography will recognize the nod to his, his work and life. And I'll say why we call our work uh, experimenting with truth. Um, so we'll see. I had a, it was very joyful for me to, to put this presentation together because I have never, I never conceptualized a project uh, in the way I'm about to present to you, although it may come across a bit dry. I hope not, because what we're doing is for me such a source of hope and joy as well. We're having a lot of fun. So, um, who we are? Uh, essentially, we're a group of people from across the globe. Uh, we came together in 2017. And uh, the, the, really, the vision was to join um, a woman called Mickey Cashton, who has been my mentor for many, many years, in experimenting with the tools and frames that she, that she developed as well as to create new ones and share them widely with people and organizations wherever we're invited to. So her work has been absolutely central, as well as our presence. Um, and now we're also trying to build on a lot of the, the things that she's been creating. She's a prolific writer and uh, a very charismatic person, which creates some issues in many ways, uh, as we can imagine, uh, even within the CHE, how do we work with charismatic leaders in bringing a vision into reality. So here's how Mickey defines herself, and I really want to name her here because she is so central. Um, so she defines herself as a practical visionary, pursuing a world that works for all, exploring the application and the principles and tools of nonviolent communication, which I discovered myself when I was at the CHE, to social transformation. So anybody who feels like somehow interested by the, the, the work I'm describing here may want to go and check her work, right? But I want, I'm, I'm now just going to talk about the organization as a whole. Um, so here's our purpose, um, to integrate nonviolence into the fabric of human life through ongoing live experiments with truth focused on individual and collective liberation. 
Um, and here's how we define liberation. Liberation is at the very, uh, very, very heart of our work. Our title mentions it, obviously, a very ambitious title. Can you imagine a nonviolent global liberation? That's what we're aiming for. Um, yeah, and uh, liberation as the undoing of the effects and the elimination of the causes of social oppression. And that's by Erika Shirova Marcuse, and her husband was Herbert Marcuse. And there's actually very little written about liberation. Uh, if you Google liberation on the web, most of the time it's uh, liberation theology that comes up. But there's been very little theorization of liberation that in a way may have other aspects of theology, which in itself has been a really interesting <coughs> discovery for me. And what are we talking about when we talk about liberation? Yeah? Um, um, and that's uh, within our project, a very big question. <laughs> um, so I want to give you, so the way I've presented, I've structured my talk is because we are quite an unusual entity or creature. And uh, what we're engaging with, as I hope I'm going to be able to show today, today, to show to you today, uh, is, is very diverse, quite complex, uh, extremely prolific, and it can be quite difficult to describe who we are as a project or as a community. So I've structured it in a very particular way, and hopefully that will help to, it's like a, a map, and hopefully that will help to understand what we're doing. And who knows, maybe you'll be excited uh, about it as well. So I want to describe some of the challenges that we engage with very consciously and which relate to uh, human ecology and what we understand by that. And then, I want to and then I want to tell you a little bit about, in quote unquote, the truth that we're experimenting with, which is simply things that we believe are possible. And then we have actual experiments to test whether those truths are indeed uh, attainable, the truth or hypothesis or interpretation, however we want to call them. That's why we are experimenting with truth. We're actually experimenting with certain beliefs about human nature or about groups or about collaboration, um, which are a bit counter current in a way. So here are some of the challenges. Uh, the gap between current global crisis and vision is increasing, increasing. The vision of a truly interdependent world as we know, this is increasing and worryingly so. And the truth that we are bringing and experimenting with is it's actually possible to engage with this gap in a way that doesn't create more separation. A lot of people who are inquiring into the mess we're in tend to do it in a way that's quite aggressive and actually doesn't necessarily uh, reflect the, uh, the, the, the world that we want to live in. So we're trying to do things in a way that truly embodies this approach of understanding, compassion, moving beyond, transforming. Integration is a really big part of our work. Um, another uh, challenge that is that aligning means with and is fraught with difficulties. How many organizations and groups do you know who've actually tried to embody the values that they're trying to see happening in the world? It's extremely challenging. So we come up with the hypothesis that actually there is no need to compromise on values to achieve a purpose. And we test that. We put in place tools. I'll come back to that. Third one is capitalism is destroying the planet and there are no credible alternatives. Here's a challenge that we're all very conscious about. And here's what we believe about an alternative, that we are experimenting with the gift economy in a really big way. And um, we have developed tools or platforms, as we call them, that help to uh, come out of the paradigm of exchange and instead uh, to help people sustain uh, themselves financially. So I'll, I'll say a bit, this is a bit cryptic, but I'll come back to tell you exactly what we're doing as, the re as regards to the gift economy. Um, oh, this is not working. Uh, Decision-making processes can be lengthy and ineffective in, um, in like self-managed groups. That's basically another challenge. So we're doing something around that too. Uh, and I see Alison kind of saying, oh, yes, 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 that's true, yeah. Okay. Um, 
where most activist organizations are riddled with conflict, uh, and we believe it's actually possible to keep moving in the presence of conflict. And we're doing it in a way that's difficult to describe how we're managing, but I can absolutely tell you that it, we are managing to do it. And I, I'm, I'm in awe about that. Another one is our models of governance are not working to address pressing global challenges. Uh, that's one of the challenges we're facing in the world today and at all levels of decision making. And we actually believe that everyone can participate in decisions that affect them. And again, we're testing that hypothesis through very specific tools and practices, which I won't have time to describe all what we're doing, um, but it's just to give you a bit of a, an essence of the kind of things that we're wrestling with and, and, and testing. And then the world over, that's another one we're working with uh, very powerfully and very uh, painfully, the world over people are questioning unequal power relations and dynamics of privilege. And our hypothesis, which again we're testing, is that it's possible to walk towards liberation for all. It is possible to walk towards liberation for all. In other words, the liberation of some doesn't need to come at cost to others. Okay, great program. <laughs> and just looking at all these challenges, and then there are others which we are not yet quite testing enough, so I haven't put them in there, but I was very tempted, particularly around violence and challenging the endemic and accelerating culture of violence. This one is very close to our heart, but we haven't yet quite engaged with it sufficiently to be able to say, yes, we're doing it. But it was in my mind when I started the presentation. So just to give you, because um, I'm keen to engage in some conversations, so I don't want to go on, but I'll give you a few, a few ideas of the kind of stuff we're doing. So on this first challenge, um, the truth that we are working with, experimenting with, is that we can actually engage with this gap without sinking into despair or going into huge rage and anger. Yeah? And stay sufficiently connected to the actual tragedy of what's happening right now without being completely disempowered and without wanting to go into violent means. Because this is actually some of the strategies, if you think about it, that most groups, whether you know, guerrillas in different parts of the world or most people who know about the crisis that we're facing, it's either total apathy and going into despair or uh, violence. Yeah? So how do we engage with this gap in a way that keeps our dignity alive, our, our a sense of empowerment, and also the, the capacity to stay tender and to say stuff and to, st to stay realistic, you know? We are in great difficulty. And so there are several ways by which we're doing that. So um, we're really trying to go very deep into the roots of the mess that we're in through a very elaborate learning program. It's like an MSc in human ecology. We have a very extensive curriculum and some people are coming to us to really go deep into what, what what is going on, but also go deep into the alternatives. You know, we study Gandhi and we study, we study Freire and we study, you know, permaculture and, you know, the whole gamut of what we used to study in the MSc in human ecology, very present there in what we're doing. Um, we have very different, we have many tools and practices uh, that we are uh, uh, engaging with internally. So I'll say a little bit more about that before <coughs> wrapping up. Um, but, um, and, and what we're doing, which I find fascinating and so exciting, is that before we go and teach our tools or share our tools to the outside world, we basically test them internally within the project. So, um, uh, so un unless we are ready, we're not, we don't go and share them. But the things where we are kind of ready or at, at the moment still experimenting with, so collaborative leadership, what does it mean to play a role of leadership within an entirely non-hierarchical structure, which is the way we are organized? What, you know, what, what does it mean, both in terms of the tools that we bring out there, but also the transformation that needs to happen inside, because we have all internalized the culture of 
control and domination and violence and the, the kind of operating system that is destroying ev everything and everybody at the moment lives within every one of us. So to nurture collaboration, we need to have to do quite a lot of inter inner liberation, if you like, uh, as well as to be able to, well, I don't know, even like present in front of you today, that's an act of leadership. And uh, that requires a bit of clarity and empowerment to not kind of collapse inside and think, I don't matter, I have nothing to share with you. Um, so, um, and I'm glad to say that Luke was able to see during the summer the, how we translate this work into organizational work, sharing some of the tools, because Luke asked me to do some work with an organization CHE has been working with here in Glasgow, and to see how we can empower organizations and share tools with them to do a much better collaboration than they, than they were able to do, yeah, how to address conflicts and that kind of stuff. So. Um, and so yes, we, we're playing with resource allocation, how to move resources from where they are needed to, to, to from where they are to where they are needed. <laughs> a, a lot of work on decision making, and uh, we a lot of work on conflict because we are full of conflicts within NGL um, because conflict is part of human nature, oh, not part of a human nature, but but is directly connected to how much we care about things, and also directly to connect it to. Uh, the diversity of how we express life going through us. You know, conflict is just because we, we, because we have different opinions and different strategies and different ideas, different experiences of life, uh, different social locations, yeah? Um, so, of course, our organization reflects uh, what's, what's happening everywhere. And the question is, how do we engage with that? Yeah, in a way that's, again, not about, like, giving in to control and, and domination, or even like, you know, you could go all the way to manipulation and violence, or putting conflict underneath the rug and say, oh, we don't have conflict, everything's okay. No, that is not, never working. Okay, and there are many other things that we're doing as well. There's even a, a land-based project that is developing at the moment within NGL. Um, to and a lot of experimentation with permaculture. So we are now also moving towards uh, the field that human ecologists are maybe a little bit more familiar with um, be because we really acknowledge that that connection with uh, the non-human world is uh, absolutely critical. So I think I'll probably have time to give you uh, maybe just another challenge. Um, so aligning means with and is fraught with difficulties. There's no, so this is the truth we're experimenting with, or the truth, right? Um, there's no need to compromise on values to achieve a purpose. So how we, how we develop a project, a way of working together, an organization uh, that, that in the way it's functioning and the way it nourishes people and the way it engages with people out there, reflects the world that we want to, to bring about and we, we want to live in. This congruence because the inner, between the inner and the outer is, is, what, we are, that is what we are experimenting with. Um, so, first of all, totally non-hierarchical functioning, although we have a very charismatic, strong, prolific writer of a founder. Um, uh, we are, have developed ways of um, working with the power that she has, both as the founder and as the person at the moment who's almost the only one who publishes. She is, you know, she's, she's the only public figure almost in the organization still. How do we deal with the power that she has and still function in a completely non-hierarchical way? It's a very interesting dilemma and a uh, very rich area of engagement. Uh, and an example on that, um, a, very, a very practical experiment is that when somebody has some feedback to give to Mickey as the main leader at the moment or a very key leader, instead of uh, they go to a feedback composter, somebody who's going to help that person to extract from the feedback that they want to give to the leader, whether it's actually something personal to Mickey, or whether something is something that pertains to a lack of systems, or some, you know, the, something that pertains to something happening or not happening within the organization. And in that way, we're helping to not put all the heavy baggage on people who are taking leadership in the organization 
And instead of looking like what is missing within the organization as a whole, how can we take more responsibility in different places of the project? Uh, instead of expecting people who have a position of leadership to be able to resolve everything. So um, we have a set of organizational systems who have very strong agreements about decision making, about how money flows from one place to the other, very structured, and at the same time really helping to give us a very strong container as to how we function on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, And then I would love to tell you a little bit about this one. Um, so, and just one tool that we're using to, to really ground the concept and the, of gift economy is that we have a tool, we have a platform, I think we can call it like that, called the Financial Gift Hub, where every trimester we have a sum of money that people have contributed to us uh, the friends of the project, maybe some funders, uh, maybe some money that have come from courses that we're running. And we distribute the money and then people who are involved in the organization make requests of how much money they would need to sustain their financial needs for the next four months. And then there's a process of discernment by a particular team that allocates money that is there in the pot according to needs, financial needs, and contribution to purpose. There is nothing in the way we're functioning that is connected to how much time people are putting in the organization, nor how much competency they have, or level of experience, or whether they publish things or not, or whether they've been here uh, contributing for six months instead of five years. Yeah? It's just focused on, ground, anchored in needs, financial needs, and uh, how much people are contributing to the purpose of the organization. And then uh, our courses are also anchored in the gift economy. We, uh, we really want to, ex to exit the dynamic of exchange and accumulation that is really at the heart of capitalism. And then just one more point uh, that I love this one. Our external funders, we don't have many, but we have a couple, yeah, uh, are invited to contribute to the financial gift hub in other words, they, they know how much of a gap there is between the money that we have each trimester and the money that we need to fulfill uh, people's requests. And they uh, contribute what they want to fill that gap. Instead of giving us a grant against which we need to produce outcomes, which is a very instrumentalized relationship between funders and, and members. Yeah. So I want to close because I'm already at 24 minutes uh, and uh, I've been given half an hour. And I would love a few, I would love a few questions. This is very, um, um, I just want to give you the last slide um, because in it you'll see that, um, oh, I don't know how to do that. Just, just what to do if you're, more, if you're hungry for more. Uh, you can talk to me. But also, um, we have uh, a number of courses that are running, and we have coaching calls, and you can be, you, we've got, you know, the website is a bit of a mess. We're building, or we're working on it. But you can become a friend of the organization and get to know it if you're interested. So uh, I'll, um, um, I, can, I can just leave that slide. Hungry for more. Who knows? You may be. Some of you may be. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, a few questions and feedback on that would be fantastic because, uh, yeah, this is completely new territory for me. I don't know how... How is it landing? Yeah, Alison. Yeah, Beth, thank you. Um, that was really interesting and a bit um, frustrating because I just want to know... I want... I really want some examples of what you've done and how you've put it into practice. Yeah, yeah do, you want to, do you want one example about something? Do you want to ask? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, there was so much. Well, you talked about the organisation you were working with. I mean, I'm interested in yes. community, and I know you've done work with community yes. out in Portugal, yes. so I'd be interested in that, but that may be very big, but it's just how you, how you go about it and what kind of tools you're working with them and what... Yep. 
are you, what kind of, um, this is talking about outcomes, but what happens, you know, what, you, what are people getting yes. out of it? So, um, we're using, we, we have developed and are using and sharing several tools. Um, the one that we use often with, most often with organizations is called the Vision Mobilization Framework. And essentially within that uh, tool, we're helping first of all organizations to discern, this is not new, right? To discern their vision, their purpose, their values, their mission, and then we look at a number of principles of collaboration and also very strong, that is new. Action, what we call action agreements, which is like a very clear set of agreements around decision making, resource allocation, information flow, conflict engagement, and feedback flow. It's an incredibly in-depth tool, and it takes quite a while for an organization as a whole to actually journey with us to be able to have this clarity of how to function, but also what the organization is about. So it's really anchoring into who are we, what is ours to do, what is the vision we're working uh, towards, and how do we pull, what do we need to put in place in the organization to pull between where we are now, the gap, between where we are now, which is often very messy if we are a visionary organization, and the vision we have for the world, yes? And then, and then within that tool, we have other tools which are really useful. One is around collaborative decision making, called convergent facilitation, which is fantastic to help uh, groups of people to make decisions uh, across very polarized fields. So I won't describe the tool right here, but we have people who are facilitators and and, 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 uh, and share this tool. We have tools around, more other tools around decision making. One is called the advice process, which some of you may have heard of, uh, because that comes from a guy called Frederic Laloux, who wrote an uh, a very interesting book many years ago called Reinventing Organizations, um, which is about how we make decisions within a, within a non-hierarchical organization that doesn't require a huge lengthy process of like, you know, having everybody's voice and then, you know, sifting through everybody's opinion is a very much more direct way of making decisions. And it goes on and on and on because, I mean, you may not believe it, but we are experimenting with so many things. Yeah, yeah. Nonviolent communication is another one for interpersonal um, relationships, which is very powerful as well. So, yeah, here's another one which you know about. Yeah. One more question, maybe? Thank you. Just a bit on how it practically works. Is it like, are you sort of consultants approached by outside organizations? Or do you go out and find projects that you want to help out? Or, yeah. Well, I, um, well um, so, so, so Mickey's quite well known, in, particularly in the world of nonviolent communication, which is quite an extended community now across the world. So often people hear about her work, they've taken a course with her, et cetera, and then you know, that's how we are, because Miki doesn't, doesn't do projects anymore. She, she focuses just on writing. So, so then others, others of us kind of follow the lead. So that often where it comes, where our requests are coming from. Um, but more and more, uh, those of us who are also engaged in the world also get uh, asked, like here in Scotland, I've, you know, I've never lacked work and I've never, this has been completely hidden in the background because I've never advertised myself for the work that I do. So I know that we're responding to a really big hunger, especially from radical groups, and, uh, and I'm glad we're not better known because right now our capacity cannot respond to the hunger that's out there. We're working on building capacity within the organization, but uh, I'm glad it's just quietly word of mouth. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sorry, oh, no, I can't, sorry, the password, yeah. Ulrich, will you have the last word? Will we give you the last word as the grand I, old I man of human I don't ecology? think it's the last word. I think it may be an early one like yours. So thank you very much because there is a whole philosophy of how one lives. And I'm struck, as you are, I think, the number of organizations around the world that are doing good things, and you're uh, one of those, that this whole organization. Um, and a man who is looking for such organizations to save the world is the new Prince of Wales, uh, Prince William, with the Earthshot Prize. 
And I just wonder how this sort of thing, and actually a lot of what CHE does, would fit in to the remit. It doesn't seem to, to me, because what he is doing is instrumental. Yes. And, and so there are, yes. there are lots of uh, permaculture, uh, carbon saving, a lot of projects around the world. They're all terrific, but you've made a synthesis here, which is an important one. And I think that is worth more for an Earthshot Prize than the practical ones um, in the end. And I just want to put the idea. Thank you, Ulrich. Yeah. Your, 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 the way I hear it is it, this is your blessing on the work we're doing, and this, this means a lot. Um, and uh, we, we could do with people who have a bit of wealth to support us. We run with so little money resources, which is a good thing because many of us have actually reduced our expenses as a result of what we're engaging with, which is what is needed. Uh, but nevertheless, thank you. It's really interesting. Yeah, and, and it means a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you.